Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our closing uh, plenary of the Research Facility on Inequality. My name is Nozipo Shabalala, and it is an absolute privilege to serve you once again as the moderator of this all important conversation. Now, before we get started today, I think it would be important for us just to pause and take a quick recap of the big conversations that we've been having over the last four days. A couple of the themes that have surfaced include the fact that we really need to look at inequalities in Africa with the lens of prioritizing them. And this is not only because we know that demographic growth is going to be coming from this continent in the future, but also because today, seven out of the 10 most unequal countries are found on the continent of Africa. There was a massive conversation around climate change and understanding this and engaging climate change within the context of existing inequalities. And of course, are bringing into the frame other drivers like pollution, um, like conflicts, um, really that are exacerbating the impact of uh, climate change as a driver of inequality. There was a lot of conversation of the last four days about the capacity of local stakeholders. And in addition to this, really thinking about how do we drive ownership um, of the measures of inequality at uh, the local stakeholder level. And if we truly want to see policies that are inclusive and processes that are inclusive, we've got to be more deliberate about engaging our local stakeholders. Now, tools and metrics, tools and measures are certainly received their fair share of the conversation, especially if we want to be serious about uh, the reduction of inequality. There was a lot of conversation, ladies and gentlemen, about analyzing the determinants of inequality and doing this more courageously in the sense of moving beyond colonial origins to really look at other variables like social capital, look, to look at growth parts as a way of really getting a comprehensive understanding on how we might reduce inequalities. Now, last but certainly not least was a conversation around spatial inequality and the extent to which these have the ability to translate into unequal opportunity. And that although we know we do have geographical targeted interventions, uh, we need to do this within existing state apparatus and be innovative about how we address some of these spatial inequalities. All of these conversations are just a snippet uh, of the last four days, but what they have done is that they've culminated to this point where we are now looking at our closing uh, session and our closing plenary. What are you going to experience today is that we're going to start off with two keynote uh, addresses. We have a keynote address from Professor Thomas Piketty, and we also have a um, keynote address from Minister Arturo Herrera Guterres, who is, of course, the Minister of Finance and Public Credit in Mexico. They're going to put forward their presentations, but we're also going to pause. We're going to give them an opportunity to react to each other's presentations. And as always, I've kept my promise of integrating your voice into this conversation. We're going to see if we can't uh, bring in a question or two from you to engage uh, with uh, Professor Thomas Piketty and of course with Minister uh, Gutierrez. After that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to broaden the conversation just a little bit into a high level panel discussion where we're really going to be looking at the political economy of inequality reduction. Remember that in these conversations, we're not just looking at policies that have worked and policies that haven't worked. We're also interested in the barriers that keep the implementation of these uh, policies not at their optimum. As I get started, allow me to also just remind you of the following. We are live tweeting. Our hashtag remains the same. It's hashtag research inequalities. So do join the global conversation on social media. I still want to hear your voices. So we are still using Slido as a way of integrating your questions. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is send me your questions and I'll try and integrate them into today's proceedings. Um, and that is it. And that really gets us ready now uh, to get start off with our conversation. You will also notice, of course, that we do have French and English interpretation to make sure that this conversation is as inclusive as possible. So I think I've done enough speaking. I know that you want to hear from Professor uh, Thomas Piketty more than you want to hear from me. So allow me to 
uh, introduce a man who hardly needs introduction. He's a world-renowned economist and professor of economics uh, at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Science uh, at the Paris School of Economics. He is the co-director of the World Inequality Labs and the World Inequality Database and one of the initiators of the Manifesto for Democratization in Europe. I'm going to end it off by, of course, mentioning that he is the author of international bestsellers, Capital in the 21st Century and Capital and Ideology. Professor Thomas Piketty, it's an absolute privilege and a pleasure. The floor is yours. And if you could unmute for me, sir. Thank oh, you. Yes, so much. yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nozi. Thank you to the organizers. So my, uh, so let me try to share my screen. Um, so uh, my English is going to sound a lot like French. So I hope this will be uh, inclusive uh, enough uh, for everybody and that you can uh, understand what I have to say. Okay, so this presentation, I, I, I think you can see my screen now. So this presentation, I have given a title, A Brief History of Equality, which is more than what I will be able to deliver in this brief talk. Basically, I will draw a few lessons from my latest book, Capital and Ideology, and from uh, the World Inequality uh, Database. So le let me start by, by saying a few words about my, my last book, Capital and Ideology, which is this is again a book about the history of inequality uh, over time and across countries like capital in the 21st century. But I think, uh, I think this is a better book. You know, I think I'm moving slowly in the right direction. I'm making progress. I mean, this is still a book with a lot of limitation. Uh, and I apologize you know, for all the limitations. You know, I'm trying to learn from the kind of discussion and, and that we have today. I think this is moving in the right direction, in particular because it is less Western centered than the previous book. You know, it covers more the rest of the world. We've made a lot of effort, and I'm going to show you some data to, to, to cover uh, uh, you know, Africa, South Asia, Latin America, and to offer a, a broader uh, global perspective on the history of inequality. But you know, this is still very much insufficient. And also, this new book puts the emphasis on politics and ideology as a key driver of uh, the transformation of inequality regime in the long run. And in that sense, this is a, I mean, this is a relatively optimistic book in the sense that I, I strongly believe that you know, politics uh, uh, and, and social mobilization can bring new institutions, which can change in a, in a very uh, important way, uh, and sometimes much faster than we, we tend to imagine the structure of uh, inequality in societies. So let me, let me start right away uh, with, I'm going to show you a couple of maps coming from the World Inequality Database. So you can go to the website, uh, World Inequality Database, uh, wid.world uh, to get more of this data. But le let me start with this map. So this is, so what you have on this map is the top 10% income share uh, across the world. So this is, I'm, I'm going to show you the bottom 50% income share in one minute, but let me start with the top 10% income share. So by definition, if we had complete equality, in a country, the top 10% income share should be 10% because this is 10% of the population. If we had complete inequality, they should get 100%. So of course, it's always between 10 and 100%. Now, what's interesting is that it actually varies quite a lot. So on this map, you can see that it goes basically from 20, 25 to up to almost 70%. So, you know, it, it doesn't go from 10 to 100, but it goes from 20 to 70, basically. So it's, it's a huge variation. So, you know, the most equal countries in the world, which would be uh, Sweden or Norway, would have 20, 25 percent. Uh, they used to uh, be closer to 20, 25. Now they are a bit higher than 25, between 25 and 30. I mean, it, it, it has changed a little bit in recent years. The most unequal country will be in our database, uh, South Africa, you know, will be between uh, 65 and 70. Some countries in Latin America, you know, I should say uh, Mexico, uh, sorry, uh, Minister, it's not your fault, but, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, around 60% in our database, Brazil, Chile are very high also. Uh, well, I, let me say a few words about the fact that, so this is a, a world map of inequalities that we have put online uh, last year at the World Inequality Database. 
this is not supposed to be, you know, perfect data. You know, we need to make a lot of progress in particular in Africa, and I will talk a bit more about that and the need to develop more cooperation with the tax administration in, in Africa in particular. But we've really tried our best to combine all available data sources, so household survey, of course, but also uh, fiscal data, national accounts, in order to get you know, comparable estimate across the world. Because the problem, as we know, is that if you only use household survey, you will tend to underestimate a lot the inequality, in particular at the top of the distribution. So if for some countries like the US or, or, or Europe, you have fiscal data, but for some other countries like Africa, you use only household survey, then you know, the, the, the Gini coefficient and the level of inequality you will compare are in fact really not comparable. So what we do here is that we always correct household survey data uh, on the basis of fiscal data. Now, of course, in Africa, we, we've made a lot of effort to develop cooperation, to, to, to digitize uh, some of the, of the tax declaration and income, get income tax data, for instance, in Ivory Coast. And you know, we have data from South Africa and, and a number of, of a few, a small number of African countries for which we have tax data. Now, for the countries for which we don't have tax data yet, what we did typically is to use some average correction that we have for similar countries, which usually, you know, it's, it does not vary all that much, this correction across countries. So we feel it's better than doing nothing at all than to have this kind of correction. So at least we have a world map, you know, which is not perfect, but which is more comparable than the typical uh, survey-based uh, uh, Gini coefficients that we, we tend to use. And one of the substantial findings is that, well, Africa is a very, very unequal. Now, it, you know, the, the Latin America is very unequal also, uh, the Middle East, uh, India. Uh, um, uh, but probably the, maybe the even more important finding is the scale of the variation. So I, I told you for, you know, the top 10% share, you know, basically it goes from, 20 to 70 percent of total income. Now, if you look the next map, this is maybe even more important for all of us who are interested in poverty and development. You know, this is the share going to the bottom 50 percent. Now, uh, again, if we had complete equality, the share going to the bottom 50 percent should be 50 percent, and if we had complete inequality, it should be zero percent. Of course, it's always between zero and 50. But it varies quite a lot. In fact, it goes from basically from five to twenty-five. So you know, in the most equal country, which will be in uh, again in Norway, Sweden, it will be around twenty-five percent, which means that you know you have fifty percent of the population they get twenty-five percent of income. So it means that their average income is on average half of the average income of the entire population. Of course, they are poor. They are the bottom fifty percent, but they are not that that much below you know the average of their country. Now, when you have five percent, so again, South Africa would have, you know, a six percent, I think six or seven percent uh, in, in Mexico or, or, or Brazil or Chile, we would be between five and ten percent. If, if you have five percent and you are 50 percent of the population, well, it means that on average you have, uh, you know, one tenth of average income. Uh, that's not a lot. And, and the bottom line that I want you to remember in terms of orders of magnitude is really that distribution matters a lot. Because when you go from five to 25% for the bottom 50% share, you know, it's a factor from one to five. So it means that for, for a given average income, you know, for a given GDP per capita, the average income of the bottom 50% can actually vary from a factor of one to five. So this shows, you know, that if you only look at aggregate GDP, and I mean, we all know that, of course, but you, you get it completely wrong about the, the living conditions, the material condition of half of the population. You know, so, so we really need to, to pay more attention to this. And, you know, that's why we try to develop at the World Inequality Database, this, this project about distribution, what we call distributional national accounts, where you know, we try to distribute uh, aggregate GDP and national income across percentile, combining national accounts with survey with fiscal data, so that then we can do some gross accounting exercise, but not only at the aggregate level, but for the bottom group, top groups, etc. Now, let me come to the more historical part of my talk, which is that the other important finding is that this different levels of inequality and income shares going to the bottom 50%, top 10%, 
they are not uh, frozen forever. You know, they change a lot over time for a given country. So if we take the case of Europe, you know, today you have 20, 25% for the bottom 50 and, and, and you know, between 20 and 30% for the top 10, but it used to be very different. So if you go back in time, you know, one century ago, in fact, the, the, the top 10% share was over 50%, between 50 and 60% in most European countries. And, and the bottom 50% share was, you know, around 10%. So, you know, a pretty low, you know, in the lowest country in the world. So how did we, uh, uh, why did we have a rise of equality over time? Uh, so, of course, you know, in recent decades, the, 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 there's been a rise in inequality. But if you take at the very long run picture, you know, there's been a rise of equality, more equality in the long run. And, you know, this is good news. How did it happen? And, and this is where I would get, like, like to get now. You know, I think one of the key uh, findings from, uh, uh, from uh, our historical work is that you know probably the rise of what I described here as the social state you know was a very important factor in the long run you know it, it brought more prosperity because investment in education public infrastructure else was very important also for for aggregate prosperity but it also brought at the same time more equality so here you see that you know before World War One you know total tax revenue were pretty small. In, in Europe. So here, this is an average for Germany, France, Britain, Sweden. There are variations across European countries, but you have by and large the same uh, long run pattern. Before World War I, uh, uh, tax revenue were less than 10% of GDP, and most of them were used to pay for the army, for the police, for you know, the, the military that would finance also the colonial expansion, the colonial empire. You know, so it was really that, that kind of of state uh, and social spending were very small. Uh, uh, you know, two percent of national income in, for total social spending before World War One. Education out of that was less than zero point five percent of national income. In the U.S. at the time, it was about one percent of national income, which was twice as much as in Europe. And there was a big educational advance of the U.S. over Europe. And you know, in the middle of the 20th century, you still had this very big educational advance. But still, it was you know, the, it was one percent of national income in 1910. So it, you know, it was very small. Today, uh, edu public educational investment in, in, in for this same set of countries in Europe is 6% of national income. So it has been multiplied, you know, it has gone from 0.5% to 6%. It has been multiplied by more than 10. And, and this together with the rise of health uh, spending and other social spending, you know, contributed hugely, uh, you know, both to prosperity and to uh, a, a equality. So that's probably uh, factor number one. Now, factor number two, is that uh, in order to make this rise of taxation acceptable for societies, you know, you had to build trust in government in how you're going to spend this money and also trust in government about the distribution of the tax burden. And so together with the rise of the social state and fiscal state in Europe, what we see in the 20th century is the rise of progressive taxation. So uh, on, on this graph, you see the evolution of the top income tax rate uh, over the course of the 20th century. So you can see it's a pretty chaotic history. You know, the bottom line is that in the middle of the 20th century, you had very, very high top income tax rate, you know, in particular in the United States, you know, it was, uh, you know, 91% the top income tax rate under Roosevelt, it was still 70% in the 1970s before Reagan was elected in 1980. If you make the average between Roosevelt and Reagan, so between 1930 and 1980, it was 80%, 81% on average. And this was just the federal income tax. You also have state income tax, but they are much smaller. Uh, and apparently this did not destroy uh, American capitalism, otherwise we would have uh, noticed it. So, yeah, and in fact, if anything, I think it came with the highest level of productivity growth uh, in the post-war period in particular uh, than ever, you know, between 1950 and 1990, productivity growth in the US was twice as large as, as what it has been since the 1980s. So, you know, the, the big, 
uh, decline in top tax rate was supposed to stimulate uh, innovation, which of course, from a theoretical perspective, uh, could have been possible, except that in practice, you know, the per capita uh, national income growth rate was divided uh, uh, by two. And, and, and I think, you know, the, why, the, the reason why this very high level of tax progressivity was successful is that because it was only for the very, very high income, which were not really useful from a, an incentive viewpoint, and it helped to build a social consensus about an overall increase of taxation and um, and investment in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in education, the, the social spending that that was very positive for for growth. Now this is for uh, the taxation of income. You have the same for the taxation of inherited wealth. So here on this graph, you know you have, you have the evolution of the top inheritance tax rate. So you can see again the U.S., the U.K., and also Japan leading the movement toward progressive taxation in the middle of the 20th century, uh, uh, much more than Germany and France, which were sort of lagging behind. That's also because in Germany and France, you've had a big redistribution of wealth through you know, uh, inflation, war destruction. So in a way, progressive taxation was less necessary. And you know, arguably, progressive taxation is a more uh, civilized way to, to redistribute wealth. But anyway, you know, that's uh, how things go. Now, Another uh, historical graph on taxation that I want to show you is this one, which is about effective tax rate. Because sometimes, you know, when people look at this top uh, marginal tax rate and statutory uh, top uh, tax rate, you know, people say, well, okay, but you know, this was not relevant because nobody was taxed at this rate. Well, in fact, it's not quite true. So here, uh, you know, what we've done is that we use the effective income tax paid by the different uh, taxpayers. And we also, so on this graph, you have also all other tax. So we take into account indirect tax, uh, payroll tax, social security tax. So this is uh, uh, the entire tax system in the US. And so you can see that again, in the middle of the 20th century, you had a very high uh, effective uh, uh, fiscal progressivity in the sense that the effective tax rate paid by the you know, top 1% top 0.1% uh, was substantially larger uh, than you know, what was paid by the bottom 50%. And I think uh, you know, this help, um, uh, first, you know, this help reduce inequality at the top of the distribution, which was very high uh, at, the, at the time. And this also help uh, you know, the, build the kind of social contract I was describing before, which is that you know, at least you know, people in the middle class or the lower middle class that were paying more tax as compared to previous historical period, they sort of knew that people at the top you know, were paying even more than them. And I think it's a problem that we have today, which is that today very often you know, people in the middle class and lower middle class feel that the very rich are escaping taxation. Uh, from our series here, it looks as if today the system is not progressive anymore uh, and it's just close to a flat uh, tax system if you take into account all tax revenue. In fact, it, may, it could be, maybe it's even worse than that. You know, it could be that uh, we don't measure very well uh, tax evasion, uh, the use of tax events by the very rich, etc. So that in the end, the, 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 at the very top, you can have effective tax rates that can indeed be below the, the middle class and even below the bottom groups, which which can make people very angry about the, you know, the welfare state and about the world in, 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 in general. And I think this is a big danger for, for all of us. Now, if we come to the lesson for Africa, for the rest of the world, you know, one point I want to make is that tax havens uh, uh, make it very difficult today to build uh, an equitable tax system, not only in the US or Europe, but even more so, I mean, you can see on this graph that uh, tax havens are even more damaging for Africa or Latin America. Uh, I mean, they are very beneficial, of course, for oligarchs in Russia and Gulf countries. But if you take you know, the entire African continent or, or Latin America, the share of financial assets held in tax havens appears to be enormous. This estimates are probably lower bound estimates. They were computed by my uh, friend and colleague, Gabriel Zuckman. Uh, he did the, the best he could to, to use at the various inconsistencies in international financial statistics to come to these estimates. Uh, uh, but you know, in any case, the bottom line is that the sort of very opaque international financial system that has been developed uh, largely by the richest country 
in the world, you know, partly to protect their own uh, billionaire against taxation, in the end has been even more detrimental to uh, countries in Africa, Latin America. Uh, you know, you can imagine how difficult it is for a tax administration uh, in, in Africa to, to fight, uh, you know, tax evasion, tax evasions, and, you know, already uh, if European tax administration and US tax administration don't do it, uh, already you can imagine how, how hard this is, uh, this is going to be for, for uh, African tax administration. And another evolution that I want to mention is the fact that Trade liberalization, uh, uh, you know, happened relatively fast, uh, you know, since the 1980s, 1990s. Many uh, African countries and low income countries lost quite a lot of tax revenue. Uh, in, in, the, in principle, you know, if this tax revenue had been replaced by other tax revenue coming from a modern income tax or from a, a wealth tax or a profit tax or whatever, you know, maybe these are better tax instruments than a trade tax, so maybe this would have been good news. But the problem, as you can see on this graph, you know, the big paradox of the of the three to four, uh, you know, past decades is that if you look at the at low income countries, so here I'm looking, low income countries are the bottom third uh, uh, income countries, so typically Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and high income countries are the top third, so typically o OECD. So you can see that in 1970, High income countries already had higher tax revenue than low income countries to begin with. And in fact, the gap has increased over time. So there's been no catch up by low income countries. Uh, so, of course, it's a very complex process you know, to build uh, uh, trust in the government so that you can build more fiscal capacity. And, and you know, I'm not saying that the the, the decline in trade tax revenue was the, was the only factor. But you know, I think this was one of the factors. And more generally, I think there was insufficient attention uh, uh, in the international community about you know, helping uh, build uh, you know, the, the tax capacity, uh, uh, and, and in particular, uh, uh, income tax uh, uh, you know, as compared to what, what could have been done and what could be done uh, uh, today. So you know, my, my own experience and our experience at the World Inequality Lab with uh, trying to develop collaborations with uh, African countries is that there's a lot of willingness uh, in, in African countries, you know, to, to build this kind of cooperation, but very often there's too little uh, support. So I, I, I was in, in Mali, in Bamako, uh, in early 2020, and had very interesting discussion about representative from the tax administration and from the, the, the Statistical Institute. And, and, and the problem is that they just didn't have the resources even to start to digitize the tax declaration uh, uh, from the income tax, from the corporate tax, uh, where, you know, basically they have almost no data. They are getting, uh, I have seen, you know, the paper uh, tax declaration. Uh, they are sitting there, but they are not being digitized at all, which means that uh, not only to measure inequality, but also to, to think about improving the tax system, it, it makes it extremely difficult. So they are being asked, you know, to fill uh, Excel tables about, uh, you know, development objective uh, uh, all the time, and which is certainly very useful, but, uh, but you know, uh, uh, they, they, you know, just basic resources to, to improve uh, the digitalization of the tax declaration of their taxpayers, either individual uh, taxpayer or uh, firm, uh, corporate taxpayer, you know, is really, is really missing. But, they, they, you know, I, I think developing more, uh, uh, you know, more collaboration in this direction is, is very important because, you know, as we've seen from the example of, of rich countries, you know, the, the construction of trust in a tax system, in the, in the social state, and the ability of a government to collect tax properly and, 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 and spend the money properly you know, has been absolutely central in the process of uh, reduction of inequality in the past uh, century. Let me conclude with this last, very last slide, which is uh, about you know, the inequality in, in uh, carbon emission, which of course is one of the major issue we, we have to address in the future and also one of the major uh, injustices and sort of negative externalities produced by rich countries 
uh, on, uh, on, on uh, you know, uh, uh, poor and, and developing countries. So this is work that we have done with Luca Chancel, who is uh, co-directing with me the World Inequality Lab, and we are we keep updating this estimate. So what you see here is that you know if you only look at total carbon emissions, you know you have sort of North America, Europe, China, approximately at the same level, and then the rest of the world. But in fact, if you look at the inequality of individual carbon emissions, so if you look at you know, emissions uh, that are made by individuals who are in the top 1% of the world distribution of individual carbon emission, which corresponds to individuals who emit more than 9.1 global average. And you know, this top 1% is quite important because overall, they, uh, they, they account for 14% uh, 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 of total emission, which is more than the share of the bottom 50% of the world. So if you take the bottom 50% of the world in terms of individual carbon emissions, they emit less than the top 1%. And you can see as this top 1%, well, basically is, is the US a lot and Europe also a little bit, very little in, uh, uh, in China in terms of individual level of emission. And, you know, that's, a, of course, that's a very serious concern. And the question is, you know, how long can we have, a, you know, free trade and free circulation of goods and services between countries that are, that are contributing, uh, uh, you know, uh, these very, very negative externalities in some cases. And, and, uh, and, and you know, this, this raises a very, very serious issue for the future. And, you know, of course, that can also be one of the factors that make Political change and ideological change uh, uh, happen at the at the world level, but you know for the time being we have mostly the the, the, the negative the negative impact of that. Let me stop there. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm, I'm looking forward for the discussion. Professor Piketty, thank you very much uh, for a very very enlightening. Uh, presentation and a sharing of us. I think you've raised a number of issues which I'm sure are going to be informing the conversation further this afternoon. You've started off with a global picture to really paint what uh, income inequality really looks like. You challenged our thinking by actually showing us that over the long term, we have seen a, uh, we have seen a rise of equality. And as a result of that, you've begun to put forward some of the variables that have led uh, to that rise uh, in uh, equality. So social spending becomes one of the talking points that you have raised uh, for us. You've spoken about progressive taxation and the impact that that has had. And of course, balancing that with a very candid um, understanding and approach of the impact of tax havens and um, as well as other variables that have the, have the, the, the impact of diluting the trust in the social system. And then of course, um, you spoke a little bit about well, how we find the state of readiness of tax systems, whether it's in Africa or Latin America, the absence of digitization to really step up to the task of domestic resource mobilization. So all of these I'm sure are going to be uh, plenty of issues that either Minister um, Guterres is going to respond to or our global audience is going to take the time to respond to. What I would like to do at this moment uh, for our audience is I'd like to introduce Minister Arturo Herrera Guterres, who we've said is the Minister of Finance and Public Credit in Mexico. Um, he, during his professional career, he has served uh, at the World Bank. He has served in private banking. He served the government of Mexico City, as well as the Ministry of Finance uh, in Mexico, in the World Bank, we know that he led several efforts to improve public management uh, in the Latin American and Caribbean region. And in private banking, he's been involved in a number of investment banking activities. We also know that he is an academic himself, uh, having taught courses on microeconomics and macroeconomics, um, as well as monetary, monetary theory. So Your Excellency, uh, Herrera Gutierrez, the floor is yours. We'll give you an opportunity to give us your presentation, after which I will expand the invitation and allow both Professor Piketty and yourself to respond to each other's presentations. For now, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Your Excellency, we can hear you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity for sharing uh, this panel with, with Thomas Piketty and, and exchange some ideas. Uh, he actually started not, 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 not as you mentioned, not see, with a map of, of inequality in the world, but with a picture of his la latest book in English. So let me start in a similar fashion. 
with a picture of his book, but in the spa, in the Mexican in the Mexican edition. I, I really enjoyed the I really enjoyed uh, reading. But let let me now move to to his map. Uh, in the in the in the very first map that he presented when he showed some levels of inequality in the world, Mexico appeared as he's pointed out in a re, in a, in red color, as 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 appear mostly all of Latin America, and that's that's not uh, that's not by by chance. Latin America, despite being mostly a middle income uh, region, is the most unequal of all the regions in the world. In fact, the, in fact, Uruguay, which is the less unequal of all the Latin American countries is most unequal than Turkey, if you want to measure in terms of the Euro expanded, expanded uh, Eurozone. So that's one of the main characteristics of, of, of inequality and the, uh, in the region. And that despite the fact that the that Latin American region has been growing relatively robust over the last 30 something years, particularly some countries like Chile, uh, Colombia, and Peru. Now, unfortunately, that has not been the case in Mexico. Mexico has shared uh, the, the first pact with Latin America of being a very unequal country, but does, does not share the other fact of Latin America being growing relatively fast. In fact, the GDP per capita of Mexico since 1982 has been growing at less, at less than 1%, uh, uh, the GDP per, per capita at less than 1% since 1982. So those are typically <clears throat> the most relevant problems that Mexico face uh, over the last over the last few decades, very unequal and very low, uh, very low growth. Now it gives me an opportunity to to uh, and as and as such, as you may imagine, this is part of what I typically discuss uh, every every day. But but not always I have a chance to discuss it in a in a, in a more historical perspective, which is what what I would like to do. That since Thomas Piketty's uh, book uh, try to try to bring this historical perspective, the social perspective. And also issues related to ideology and what he called frontiers and, uh, and, and property. And those are, as in many countries, long issues that has been uh, hanging over the way in which policy has been developed in, in, in Mexico. I mean, I mean, since the colony first and all the way to the revolution when the main asset, and, and if you want to talk about income distribution or, or, or more wealth distribution, the main asset was land. And, and it's not surprising that than the, than the, than the Mexican Revolution in, in, in 1930, it, it, it has several aspects to which were motivating it. Uh, one was democracy, or what was the ability uh, to elect in, 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 free, uh, in, in free elections uh, the president. But, uh, but the main important was uh, land redistribution. And uh, in, 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 a, in a rather compl complex way, it was not also about breaking, breaking, bring, big land owners, but also it was so, something that was important in terms of, 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 of property. There, there was from going back to the pre-colonial uh, times, a very specific way in which, in which, in which land was owned, which was collective, uh, collective uh, property, which was in the indigenous population was, uh, it was kind, a, a kind of a, a common means of, 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 of production, if you allow me to use. To use that term, and it was, and it became a big issue at the at the at the beginning of of, of 1910. So there was a a, 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 a a an agrarian reform, a land redistribution, plus laws that were enacted that protected collective collect, collect, collective property in what in Mexico was called elegido, which was this uh, property that was owned in 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 the in the rural south. At the same time, there was an, a, a starting uh, large focus to try to increase, I, I would say, three different kinds of issues. One is what we will now call income distribution. The second one is social mobility. Uh, and the, the third one is to move people out of poverty. And that, those don't necessarily move in the same direction. People could be moving out of poverty, but if the income goes sufficiently high, you could end up with a with a worse uh, income in, income income distribution. And there were several fronts in which it, this this was work during the I would say the first half of the of the of the of the 20th century. Uh, one, as I said, was what happened in land. The second one, one were very very strong efforts to increase public education as a means to increase human human capital also health uh, health services and starting in the late 1930s uh, early 1940s was the establishment of a social security system that will provide 
extensions, etc. Very interesting between the period of the 1920 and our 1940s was also a stronger force and, 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 and laws enacted to protect uh, unionization, which, which as, as we know, is an important part, uh, plays an important role when, when you talk about, uh, about income, uh, income, in, income distribution. After the 40s, unions were mostly captured by, some, by the state in one way or the, or, or the other. Uh, uh, for 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 a for a long for a long for a long part, and that, that and that's pretty much I would say the way in which the country was was trying to evolve until the, until nineteen eighties with one very specific issue. As I said in the early nineteen twenties, a, a big chunk of the of the of the conversation was about uh, 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 about the countryside. But uh, Mexico, as most countries, as it happened with capitalism, started to, to, to move towards a country that was mostly rural to a country that became mostly urban. Actually, the, the breaking point when, when Euro, rural and urban, uh, Euro, Euro, urban pro, uh, population crossed was 1960, was 1967. Um, uh, so, uh, and then we, we come to, uh, to, to, the, to the very, very relevant break in 1980, which is uh, uh, a breaking of uh, the, uh, I would say, the, the um, uh, economic model and, uh, uh, and, and a model, an ideological, an ideological break. It's also the period of liberalization, etc. And as it has been documented elsewhere by many people, including Thomas Piketty and his team, you start having uh, a, 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 a move in the opposite direction of income of income distribution. Now, uh, there's a particular aspect in which this is a slightly different in Mexico and Latin America than in the rest of the world, because it's not only a move toward, I would say, more liberalization in a very traditional way and a conservative policies, but it also coincides with a period of the debt crisis an inflation period in, in Mexico, and the debt crisis leads to a fiscal uh, fiscal pop, uh, fiscal finance crisis. Now that actually exacerbates uh, the the problem of income distribution, because inflation. One of the consequences of inflation is that salaries, as being slightly more more sticky than the rest of the prices, have a much more difficult to catch up. Uh, uh, so, so one of the way in which income, re income uh, regressive income uh, phenomena happened was because the salaries were unable to keep their purchasing power in real in, in real time. Uh, the second one is that uh, as as the crisis created a problem in fiscal finances, that that became in part, uh, in fact, a way to curb the growth in public in public expenditures. So expenditures in issues related to education, health, etc., which are not only ways to improve human capital, but are ways to, to, to improve uh, social mo mo mobility, were heavily, they were heavily constrained during, the, uh, during, during this, uh, uh, during this uh, period. So, so that's why also we, 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 because we have a different story uh, than many other countries, we think that macro stabilization and, and having uh, uh, stable public finance is not only a matter of 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 of, of, of large aggregates of great aggregates of macros, but it's also a precursor to to make sure that you could guarantee policies that that are are, are prone to have a better income distribu distribution and social and social mobility. Now. A little bit later, we start with a with, with, with a program which has has changed names over time. Was Progreso, Oportunidades, Solidaridad, which is one of the very first programs in conditional cash transfers. And to some extent, that kind of programs were relatively successful. Probably not in the long run, in the sense that they, they wanted to move income in, 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 in uh, social mobility, but, yet, but in the short run in terms of pu pulling people out of poverty. But as, as it was shown by uh, Branko Milinovic and also by, by, by Tomas, that was probably focusing on the, on the lower end part of the income, the, of the income uh, distribution. So, so you, could, you, could, you could look to the elephant-shaped kind of graph 
that is mentioned by both of these artists in a very, very acute way in, in, in Mexico. Now, one, one additional issue which is extremely relevant in, in Mexico, and it may, may explain some of our challenges moving forward, but also some of the issues that were, uh, were, were, were mentioned uh, by Thomas, and it's related to our macro framework and our, our, fiscal, uh, uh, our, uh, our fiscal position. Um, as you know, for the last uh, 40 years or so, Mexico has been uh, uh, a very large uh, oil producer. And one of, one of the, uh, uh, on the one hand, this is, uh, this is just mana coming out of, 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 of the sky. But on the, on the other hand, what that means is that, is that we were able to finance until very recently, large percentage of our budget out of, 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 oil, of oil resources, as opposed from taxation, which is, was the, a very important point that Thomas wa, wa, was mentioning. And I think this goes very much in sync to, to a view in which uh, I would say uh, 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 the perspectives have been changing over the last few years. Because until very recently, probably over the last, uh, or, uh, until, until 10 years, the, the, uh, the standard view was that um, you try to address issues on the social front and on, on the income distribution front, front on the expenditure side. You didn't address them from the income side. And the income was just a source to make sure that you were funding whatever you needed on the, expend, on the expenditure side. And now it is, it is proved that the revenue side has two effects. On the one hand, it produces resources to, 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 to have act, active policies, but that, uh, on the other hand, it's also make a mechanism to improve income distribution within a country. Now, the fact that we were a very important oil producer means that even now we only collect less than 14% of GDP on taxes. So, 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 so what, what, what makes us different than other countries is, yes, we have high income, in, income inequality like, like Latin America, but with low growth and with very low taxation, uh, ta taxation rates and, and, uh, 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 and tax, uh, and tax, uh, and tax uh, uh, collection. Now that, that brings us to, to where, where we are, what, 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 what kind of country do we, do we have now? So one of your top of your first uh, charts in, in your book, but also in, in your presentation, which is a different way to measure in, in inequalities to focus on the percentage of the national income that is captured by the top 10%. And, and probably what you, you're trying to address with that is this elephant shape because uh, otherwise the Gini coefficient may not be moving on the same direction. Uh, you, 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 were, you were showing uh, uh, results that were probably for some countries in the mid 55%. For Mexico, this is 59%. This is one of the highest concentrations in the top 10%. Uh, in the, in the top 10%. Now, what, 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 what we, do we need to do now? Now, let, 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 me, uh, uh, let me make, a, 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 let me make the, the problem slightly more broader because that, this is one particular sp specific kind of inequality. When we, when we address the issues of inequality in Mexico, we have to take a broader approach. And let me just give you uh, three or four numbers. Uh, the GDP per capita in Mexico City, where we, we, which as the country, Mexico City itself, is an unequal, uh, is an unequal society, is almost seven, per, seven times higher than the GDP per capita in Chiapas. The GDP per capita in the second wealthiest state, Nuevo León, is more than far, four times the GDP per capita of Oaxaca. And in the very old times, there was this, this, this hypothesis of the catch-ups in which uh, lower income uh, uh, economies will eventually catch up with higher ones. We have actually a divergence in Mexico. So when we talk about inequality in Mexico, it's not only about inequalities of social between, among social groups, or classes, if you want to use a, 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 an old term, but it's also about regions. And the second one that I want to mention, which is also one of the main difference with respect to our peers, is inequalities in between genders. Just give me one number there. Less than 50% of prime age women in Mexico are in the labor force. So there are cultural issues, etc. But it's very difficult to come that that is sufficient to explain why we have a lower female participation 
dan Colombia, dan Perú, dan Bolivia, dan Ecuador, a dan El Salvador. Right? So, so these are these are rich. Now, what 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 we need to do, and as 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 well as uh, as as Tomar, he he because that's where his research is, is is leading him. Me because I'm a public officer. Let me let me finish in a slightly more positive uh, in a slightly more positive uh, note. First of all, I would say um, these are issues that, for some reason, are starting to converge the concerns about them, and the societies were very much in sync to try to move in a different direction. Clearly, clearly in Mexico, that was one of the cases, and that explains to a large extent uh, why there was a change in the, in the previous uh, national, uh, na, uh, na, na, national election. Second, although, although there has been an increase, a prevailing increase of inequality across many, 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 many countries, and um, people has been has been showcasing the cases in, in Western Europe and the US, which are much smaller <laughs> in equality than the one we have in Latin America and Mexico. People understand that now is an issue that needs to be addressed and that it needs to be, that, and it's better for everybody if it's addressed. Let me just give, 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 give you an example. We were able to pass a reform, a pension reform last fall in which most of the Actually, all of the of the increasing the contribution is going to come from the private sector, and it's going to increase the assets under management of the pension fund from 17% to 40%. And this was basically because uh, uh, some of the leading uh, uh, voices in the in the private sector at the firm levels were understood that it, it was impossible to keep having a country with this sense of of, of this party. And my, my, my sense is that that's where we were before COVID hits the world and hits everybody, including Mexico. And COVID, it, COVID is a tragedy and it has effects on, on many fronts. One, one is in income in, on in inequality and poverty itself. Uh, as, many, as many countries, when we imposed a lockdown last year, that, that displays a very large number of firms, particularly small firms and workers, and particularly those workers that are unable to work from home. And that's typically people who have jobs on the, on the, on the lower end of the, of, the, of the income distribution. I wouldn't be surprised if when the, when the next national survey comes, poverty has increased uh, substantially and inequality has increased substantially. But, but COVID has also brought to the surface some issues that were somehow underneath of the national discussion. One, one obvious is, for example, do we have the health services, the public health services do, that we need? And, and clearly, as most countries, we have to scale up our health, service, health services uh, during COVID. But if we want to make that permanent, that will require us to finance it. And that will require us to reconsider, among other things, where is the money and what's the, tax, the relevant tax structure associated with it. But also has brought something different, which is this sense of collective responsibility that is needed to address COVID. And that is opening an opportunity to discuss ma many of these, of these issues. These issues that there are many issues relevant, like a pandemic that requires the, ac the, the, uh, the, the action of everybody involved in a society, society it's important and the, 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 the fact that you protect others when you protect yourself with many ways, including using a, a mask, is creating a, 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 an environment in which many of these issues are is possible to open a window to, the, to, to discuss it. So, 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 so with that note, uh, I, I'll stop and with the hope that we will be able in the post-COVID economy, be able to construct a better world and I'm, I'm, I'm more, more inclusive and more, more just. Thank you. Uh, Minister Gutierrez, that was uh, an, an, inc an incredible contribution um, uh, in terms of a keynote. I won't call it a comeback because we're not, we're not in the ring. We are about sharing ideas and I'm, I'm mindful of time. So I, I do want to just maybe acknowledge uh, the usefulness of you giving us a historical lens, speaking to some of the levers from a policy perspective that uh, the government used in order to try and address um, inequalities as much as possible, but also bringing us to the current frame, talking about 
uh, the broader approach that uh, Mexico is taking on to um, understand and measure inequality and of course including gender inequality which is something that hasn't been um, scaled across the world and of course landing on the point of the impact of COVID-19 and how that has had an impact of increasing inequality and increasing poverty of course not leaving out the positive side of that to say we have come to a point where uh, we are finally having um, a sense of collective responsibility about how we engage and respond. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to open the floor and I'm going to allow each of you, and I'm going to ask for a lot of discipline because I'm going to give you two minutes each just to respond to what you have heard. So, uh, Toma, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance first. I'm going to ask you, having listened to Minister Guterres, in two minutes, what are some of the key things that you would like to react to? Uh, well, you know, I, first, you know, I've learned a lot and I actually I would like to ask more questions to to uh, to Arturo, you know, uh, it's it, in particular, I know I'm wondering why, according to you, you know, is, is Mexico such a low uh, uh, female uh, participation rate and, you know, what what should be done, what could be done and how did it happen and, and I get, you know, there are many other questions, but, you know, the, you, you mentioned the fact that oil revenue sort of prevented in a way or did not help historically uh, uh, Mexico to build more tax capacity. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when, when did it start being really a key factor or, or, or is, the, is the lag in, in tax capacity building, did it, did it start earlier than oil revenues really became? Because Mexico in a way for all of us is a puzzle that, that there was this very ambitious attempt, as you mentioned already one century ago to have this ambitious land reform policy and then building the beginning of a social security system and and it did not quite deliver you know including within latin america uh, uh, some countries like argentina which of course have a very different history somehow managed to build um, you know more more uh, inclusiveness in, in some limited manner and and uh, yeah, I don't know. I would like to continue the discussion forever with you. But the, 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 the specific difference on female participation that you mentioned, I'd be happy to, to, to learn more about this. So I think it's a fantastic question and very smart of you not to react, but to ask a question. So Minister Guterres, over to you. How do you respond uh, to this question of uh, the representation of women and how income inequality um, has played itself out across that gender lens? Minister, if I can ask you to unmute, please. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. So that's exactly the question that we ask ourselves, because this was a problem that was easier to spot, that understand as causes and, uh, and, and the solutions. And because at the beginning, we thought it was a cultural issue, right? Uh, Latin America, a macho, a macho region. But then that didn't explain why we have lower participation rates than Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, and Brazil, uh, right? And, and, and it seems that we have a, 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 a series of, of causes that are compounding each other. Let, let me just mention two that we are, we are, we are, we are working on, because once you, once, you, once you identify the reason, then you have to, have to move towards try to, ad, to addressing it. Uh, one, one is a, 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 the lack of a national system of care. So when, when, when you have small kids in a country or when you have elderly people in, the, in families. And as, as countries are, are, are growing, are progressing, life span is also uh, is, is improving. And that's usually, uh, it's a good thing, but it's, but, but it's becoming by default that women are the one who are caring for, for them. So the one thing that we are doing now is trying to understand uh, how to create a national system, how much it will cost, and how and how we will uh, and how do, do we share the finance? We think that eventually will pay by themselves. Let me let me just give you a number. If if we have the the, the 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 participation rate of a country like Argentina, that will include two or three more million people of, of women into the labor force. That probably will pay for the for the system. Either. The second one, which is something that we have to that we have to work really really strong on that is that particularly in large metropolitan areas where there's an issue of very large commutes from the outskirts to the, to, the, to, to the job, insecurity plays a role. 
if somebody has to commute two hours in and two hours out, that's a lot of time to feel unsafe during the, during the day. And the third one is issues related to, that was a surprise by the way for us, we didn't have it in the radar. And the third one is about uh, flexibility. Uh, more jobs required to have flexibility for females because usually again, they are the default if they have to take uh, care uh, of some issues uh, at home. Now, the digital economy is, 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 is opening a, an, a, an opportunity right there. But the fact there's an opportunity doesn't mean that there's a solution. What we are finding is that we have to train them to, to be able to do that. And we actually finished a program over the last few months of how to retrain women to insert themselves in the digital economy. And we expect to scale it up soon. I'll probably stop there. Minister Gutierrez, I think it's a fantastic answer. The care economy keeps coming up in these conversations around inequality, and it's really interesting to see how your government is looking at this economy. Insecurity across um, transport infrastructure is real for women around the world, and that's an interesting uh, insight that you've lifted there. And of course, the opportunity for flexibility as we're looking at new ways of working coming to the surface. Now, Minister, I don't know whether you're going to be as cheeky as Mr. Piketty and ask a question yourself, uh, or are you going to take the opportunity to react? You've got two minutes. That's what I'm going to give you. It's totally up to you. No, I, I mean, there, there are two obvious things that are, that are relevant. And, uh, and one is, uh, and let me, let me start where I, where, I, where, I, where I finish in my previous, in my answer, when you have the issues related to the digital economy. The digital economy is, is raising two very obvious challenges in the, in the, in, in the world. One is, uh, um, is, is becoming a larger and a larger share of the, of the, of the, of, of the GDP. So it's growing faster than other, than other sectors. But on the other hand, is, 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 is much more difficult to tax. Uh, for example, in the, in the very old, old, old days when people, uh, when all the intellectuals were in Mexico City and they were reading the New York Times or, 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 or Le Monde, they basically had to buy it in a, a special store here and they have to pay taxes here. Now, if they, they want to buy, they read those, those two papers, they subscribe online and they pay taxes in the US or, 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 or in France. And this in fact has been the much more uh, uh, contentious problem among, I would say, a discussion among G20 countries where there was basically an agreement by 19 out of the 20 to reach uh, this idea of having uh, 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 a basic world uh, tax on that. And there was one holdout, which was the US in the previous administration. Uh, Janet Yellen just you mentioned that they are willing to move along. And that's probably in terms of both taxation, which was, was the issue raised by Thomas, in terms of, of global inequality, extremely important. I wonder how, how optimistic does he feel that this will be able to land, uh, to, uh, to, to land properly? Okay, I see what you've done there. So you've not only responded to the question, but you've asked a question as well. Uh, uh, Toma, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Um, I mean, Minister, you know, as I, as I give the, the, the baton over to Toma for one last time, I must say you hit one of the central questions that had come from our, uh, from our global audience. And so Toma, maybe you can react to this as well. And the question was about how do we ensure that there is more effective taxation of the digital economy, but more importantly, what is your expectation of OECD countries and their plan in this regard? What could they do better when it comes to, to this particular issue? So you've got 30 seconds. I'll be lenient and make it a minute, Thomas, but that's the final contribution. Okay, well, I, I am more optimistic than, you know, under Trump, but, uh, but you know, I am less optimistic than, uh, than if we had a different, uh, European governance system. I think the fact that we still are under unanimity rule for tax decision in Europe, you know, it's a big limitation to the role that Europe could play in moving toward a more equitable tax system globally. Because in the end, at the end of the day, Europe is unable to make decision. You know, we complain all the time about, uh, you know, Trump and we will complain about Biden as well. But the truth is that we are not playing you know our role because each individual country can put a veto and so we actually never take a decision about a 
corporate taxation. Look, maybe some things will happen at OECD, but in any case, it will be much less than what could happen if we had majority rule uh, decision making and, and tax issues, which more, uh, you know, parliamentary uh, deliberation and decision. And, you know, I've been, as you mentioned at the beginning, I've been one of the author of this manifesto for the democratization of Europe, which proposes to put, uh, you know, tax issues, uh, uh, you know, in the competence of uh, European assembly uh, using national parliament members and not only the current European parliament because tax issues are, in, you know, are really the domain of national parliaments. So anyway, there would be a lot more to say, but, uh, you know, as long as Europe is not fully on board on these issues, I'm afraid there will be limited uh, uh, progress in international cooperation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Thomas. So unless uh, Europe is on board, and of course, that speaks to the theme um, that um, that uh, the minister did raise earlier on, saying in Mexico, there's a sense of collective responsibility. And what I'm hearing you saying, Tomar, is maybe that is what's missing from the global conversation is that sense of collective responsibility and collective ownership. I'm going to give the minister the final word on this because as we talk about the OECD and the gap that we are highlighting in terms of them really stepping up uh, to leadership in this particular space, we know that Mexico um, sits within that grouping. So maybe minister, a final word from you before we wrap up this piece. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I would probably say that as, as we start moving out of the pandemic, we cannot, uh, we cannot make of this kind of an impasse, a large impasse, and going back to the world that we have in 2019. We should, we should take this very painful opportunity uh, to, to build it better. And that, and that includes addressing issues of income inequality, uh, gender, trade, which we didn't talk about it, and of course, climate change. That those, those were issues that were extremely relevant before COVID hit the, 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 the world. They are, they are even more relevant now, but we should, we, we, should, we, we, we should take the opportunity that we are addressing this major, major issue together to try to build upon and uh, for, for, to solve the, those other issues. Minister Gutierrez, thank you very much. Now, I want to close off this conversation by doing this. The minister corrected me when I started speaking and said, uh, Toma did not start speaking about the global map. He did start with his book. So let's just make sure, Minister, that you and I are square, because we <laughs> also have a book here in Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, hopefully we're getting a digital signature in the airwaves on the back of that. It's a massive thank you uh, to Professor Thomas uh, Piketty as well as His Excellency Minister Arturo Herrera Gutierrez for an absolutely insightful conversation. It has felt like a masterclass uh, in uh, global inequality and of course with a special case study on Mexico. Thank you very much both for this opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, as we pick up on the conversation, I'm going to um, ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please stand by and don't go away because the conversation continues. I've made you a promise that at the back of uh, the interaction between Thomas Piketty, Thomas Piketty as well as Minister Guterres, that we are going to be expanding this conversation into a panel discussion. But as we head into our panel discussion, take a moment to please enjoy this following video. It is a video that really uh, captures the spirit of one of the reasons that we are here for, which is of course the launch of the second phase of the research facility. This video is going to speak to some of the future research areas. It's going to speak of course uh, to um, the continued partnership and collaboration with research centers, with other donors, and of course, with governments and local authorities in particular. On the back of the video, we're going to go into a panel discussion. So hang 10 and I'll see you on the other side.
really hope that you're going to be responding to the invitation to join us on this second phase of the facility. As we move on, I'm keeping my promise of expanding the conversation into a broader discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce my panelists. I'm going to start off by introducing uh, Luca Chancel. He is the co-director of World Inequality. He joins us in this panel. We're also joined by Martin Seychelles. He is the Deputy General Director in the Directorate General for International Partnerships at the European Commission. Uh, you will see on your screen, uh, Ms. Emilia Garcia. She is the CEO of Teco uh, Mexico, as well as uh, a member of FIA. She's a young activist. And so very importantly today, uh, infuses the voice um, of young people into the conversation. Um, you will also help me welcome uh, Tomar Melonio. Uh, he is the Director of Innovation, Research and Knowledge um, at that particular division at the AFD. Welcome, Tomar. And of course, we welcome back Minister Gutierrez, uh, who has stayed with us in the conversation. Let me start off with yourself, Luca. When we think about the World Inequality Database, what does it tell us about the barriers to uh, the, the political economy barriers in fighting inequality? Well, you know, I think, and first of all, thanks for, for the invitation. Good afternoon to everybody. I think that, you know, one of the biggest bar barrier today is that um, governments and policy actors are not looking enough at the information at hand, at the data at hand, in the sense that we continue to think in many countries as if we hadn't had four decades of attempts to, you know, bring uh, uh, tax rates down and to deregulate the economy. Now that we've we've done this experience live in many countries, and that we've realized that this didn't necessarily lead to higher growth rates for the bottom of the distribution or for the middle income groups in many countries, and that it didn't lead to higher employment rates for uh, the vast majority of the population, then perhaps we can start to try to uh, discuss about alternative policy options. And these alternative policy options may include different ways to look at taxes, so more progressive taxes, different ways to look at how we intervene as government, how governments intervene in the economy. And we still continue to base, or a lot of governments continue to base their thinking about economics without enough information about the distributional impacts of their policies, that is the inequality impacts of the policies. So we need more data and we, and now that we starting to have this data, we need more governments and policymakers that actually use this data. That's a big barrier today. Fantastic, Luca. That's such a strong start to say that not only do we need more data, but we need to start using the data. Uh, and as you've said, you're calling for alternative lenses in terms of um, the, the use of policy and maybe what I would love to do is maybe just quickly circle back to Minister Gutierrez uh, on the back of that response, uh, um, uh, uh, Luca. Minister, as you ended off your interaction with Thomas, Thomas Piketty, you did end us off by talking a little bit about the, the impact of COVID and beginning to look at the current situation and the future. The question to, I'd like to bring to you now is, what are Mexico's actions to ensure a, a sustainable and an inclusive recovery? Because this is the big conversation now. How do we recover? To use your own words, Minister, you said we need to build back better. So how do we ensure that we do it in Mexico in a way that is both inclusive, but is also sustainable? If I can ask you to unmute. Yeah, I think I'm on mute now, right? Yes. I have a top of control, one here and one by my people around, and they are very, very tricky. Uh, no, I, I, I think, uh, let, let, me, let me first go back to, to one of the issues that Luca just, just, just mentioned, which is like, if, if over the last four, four decades things have not been particularly working, we should try something different. I'm not, I'm not sure if I, if I, if I mentioned it, he mentioned it exactly with this. And that's one of the things that we did. And, and on the fiscal side, we did two things. Uh, one was to realize that we could collect a little bit more taxes with not, without necessarily, at least at the first try, to increase taxation. And that was basically by, by closing some of the, of the gaps that were, that were uh, helping tax evasion. And, uh, and we have a lar very large surprise in 2020. We have the largest decrease 
in GDP since 1932. And we were extremely surprised that we increased marginally tax collection. So that means that the tax evasion that was around was so large that even when in the, with the largest hit, we were... Uh, uh, the second one is what do you do with those taxes? Uh, what do you do with those revenues? And, and, the, and the common view was that the budget is incremental, that is really inertial, that there's very little that you could do, that the budget is committed. Uh, but the president, <laughs> he, he put us a, bit, a, a very, very complicated task. He, he decided to really redo the, the, the budget. And that's a painful, that's a painful situation because you, you make large cuts in programs that you don't believe that they are working, but somebody was receiving those programs and you channel back those, those, those programs. So let, let, me, let me mention two things that we think are, are really important and are slightly related to the, to the labor force. So, 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 uh, yeah. One is in terms of, uh, we, we see that a large, a large uh, problem of income, of social mobility and income distribution was that, 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 uh, that the, the income distribution of the income of the, of the young is very much correlated with the income of the parents. And one of the, of the things that was happening is that um, as soon as they were reaching certain age, let's say 16, 17, even, even, even slightly older, even if they were in a school and they were doing well, they abandoned the school because they have to help uh, their, hand, their house. So what, what, so what we created was a, was a very, very large scholarship program. And the scholarship program plays two roles for people in that way. Not, not only provides a support, but it, it, it also put a number to the opportunity cost because, because if they go back to support their family, they may be earning less than what the scholarship is providing. So that may help them to stay, to stay there. And that's one of the things that we want to double, back, double down when, uh, for, for, for the recovery. The other one is in the labor, in the labor force. Uh, we, uh, there, there was an increase of, 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 of the use of outsourcing to a large, to extend that now, currently, for 25 percent of all the formal labors in the in the in uh, all, all the formal jobs in the in the economy are through an outsourcing com company. So that means that they have less success, social security, health services, pension, etc. So we are changing the the, uh, the laws uh, with the help also of the private sector to ensure that if there's a legitimate way why people need to outsource, that's okay. But if not, we, we have to do it. So it's about taking care and making sure that we have better jobs uh, from, from, from now and, and into the future. Minister Gutierrez, it's a, it's a fantastic response to an issue that Luca has raised, which is, you know, are we making data-driven decisions? Are we looking at policy from a data-driven perspective and allowing the data to guide us in terms of where to direct that policy? And you have given us a, a, a few examples of how Mexico has changed direction, um, having looked at the data and the impact of its own policies. But maybe let me come to you, uh, Emilia, because we know that in order for that change in direction to take place, oftentimes it requires engagement. It, it requires um, engagement with government so that there is a change in direction in terms of uh, how we are addressing inequality. So the question to you is, as an activist, what are the best practices that you have observed in terms of engaging governments in the reduction of inequality? What works? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be, to be here. Uh, what we've seen is um, it is very important to, to have data-driven decisions as, as it was previously discussed, but this information has to be accessible uh, for everyone and authorities. I, I'd like to, to make two points. We need to identify which are the authorities that, that come into place when a decision is taken. So there's a, a myriad of options there. And then authorities have to understand that it implies a shift in power. They have to acknowledge that. And that implies uncomfortable conversations and really taking a multidimensional uh, approach, having uh, a representative um, participation from, from people, an actual, an actual opportunity of co-designing these programs and decisions. Because as far as, as we've seen, best practices um, have not been seen when, when authorities only ask people or, or do a, a may, maybe an exercise of consultation, it, it, it implies a lot more than that. We need people to really have a space 
to change and adjust and co-design these types of programs. Um, so we do have, we, we're looking for this balance for, for technical, academical, data-driven um, process, and then the political part of it. And then of course, the, the civil society's participation, because if, if we look at history, we've seen a lot of evidence where civil society has been the one to push these, these changes. And, and for instance, it, 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 it is difficult for people to find the spaces. I would like to, to put on the table a, a special example for Mexico and slum inhabitants. Uh, the minister was previously, previously talking about property and how uh, we're, we're talking about more than 70% of people and more than 70% of people in poverty live in urban areas. So slum inhabitants, not only in Mexico, but worldwide are, are special uh, example of inequality uh, of people that have been trying to, to to really push for that space for them to be heard. And uh, Mexico is in the way to become one of the first uh, countries in the, in the world to have official information about how many people live in the slums and where they're located. And that was uh, a people's power achievement. And, and just to be clear, like people's power achievement, uh, there's no political party that is uh, that owns it. We're talking about real, really grassroots level pushing, and 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 this was uh, thanks to slum inhabitants organizing and really coming to the judicial power in this in this case to present uh, a situation where data was not being collected by the official authorities, and we've seen that where the authorities have this space for 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 listening, then. The policies that come after that will really take into consideration and have the success factor that we're all looking for for this shift in power. Amelia, I think I mean your your point uh, resonates strongly with one of the insights that came out of our, our opening plenary, which was this idea of also putting the lens of inequality of voice um, as one of the ways in which we should be thinking about inequality. And as you speak about. Uh, broadening the decision making um, um, uh, uh, pool, making sure that we're co creating and co designing policies uh, in a more inclusive way. You talk about really bringing in civil society um, into the conversation and then unleashing the people's power as we talk about looking at inequality. It feels like we're coming full circle in terms of the conversations we started off with in the opening plenary. So thank you for that contribution. Allow me then to go to uh, uh, Toma Melonio. Toma, you know, we've been having a really great conversation about understanding um, the, the, the barriers that exist within the political economy, but what about the tools? So if we think about um, an organization like the AFD, you know, what are the tools that uh, organizations like yourself could be using to overcome these political economy barriers uh, as you pursue uh, inequality reduction. Thank, thank you so much, Nozi. Uh, first, I'd like to say that AFD as a development bank uh, is demand driven. So we only work with countries that have the determination to fight inequality. Some, some do, and we have seen that uh, Mexico is amongst them. Some actually do not ask us to, to work with them on inequality, so we don't. So, so first, I'd like to specify that we, we have tools, but only with countries that actually are committed to fighting inequality. I'd like to, to, to describe an example of something we've done in Morocco. So we will leave Mexico for, for just a few seconds, but uh, for the benefit of the audience. Uh, in Morocco, we, we together with the government, we, we worked on a fiscal incidents and the progressive effects not only of taxes, but also on, of social spending. It was said earlier on by Thomas Piketty and Minister Herrera Gutierrez, uh, but of course the redistributive effect can come from social spending. And we have found that typically in Morocco, uh, the, uh, amongst the poorest 10%, 39% of the revenues come from so social spending and in particular education, which is particularly well, well targeted. So, of course, when we think about uh, the fight against inequality, we, we think about taxes, we, it has been discussed earlier on, but also well targeting uh, expenses uh, uh, is very and, uh, and extremely important. Um, we, we have seen a video about the next phase of the, this research facility, and typically we, we plan to work with uh, four governments, so Mexico again, uh, Colombia, South Africa, and Indonesia, uh, in particular to accompany efforts to measure how spendings can help uh, reduce inequality. But against the tools 
uh, we design are only uh, they are useful when governments uh, ask us to to work with them uh, when we do loans for example it's uh, we have a country that takes the risk of uh, borrowing to fight inequality it's a, it's a big risk so i'd like to acknowledge the the effort of, of such governments and again the, the this research uh, uh, um, undertaking that we we're having with uh, many local researchers um, uh, can only take place uh, when there is sufficient uh, political commitment and uh, you know there are many people theorizing uh, trickle down economics but uh, we have seen that it's a bit more complicated and that we uh, certainly need to measure precisely how uh, social spending can reduce inequality thank you yeah that's a that's a powerful point there is that we need to go beyond theorizing about trickle down uh, um, economics and really uh, track uh, whether you know the the intended uh, the intended funds are reaching the grassroots as Amelia uh, had indicated and identified. I mean, you speak about you know demand driven uh, organization, and it's of course this speaks to the importance of political will. And back to this core issue that Minister Kutel has raised, which was you know are we are we highlighting and prioritizing inequality as the one big thing that we need to get right as part of building back better so maybe an opportunity now to bring in um <clears throat> to bring in development cooperation as an angle mr seychelles i'd like to bring you into this conversation and and we've been talking about policies so the question to you is what policies policies do you think uh, development cooperation actors uh, should promote in partner countries if we really are to overcome the political economy barriers that are stand in the way of inequality reduction. Well, thank you. I mean, I'd like, first of all, to put this in the context of what Minister Guterres was just saying uh, about the impact of COVID. And, and there's been a lot of discussion, of course, of how COVID is exacerbating uh, inequalities. But one aspect which maybe is not talked about sufficiently is um, as Minister Guterres mentioned, this is also now the time when we need to talk about uh, building back better. And it's also a time to seriously question some of the assumptions we've been making over the years. Uh, this is not just a question of returning to whatever we're doing in January 2020. I'll just mention a few quick examples. Um, you know, we, of course, the world depends a lot on financial markets, for example. And it's true that more developed financial markets. Uh, may theoretically uh, enable more individuals to borrow, but there are countless studies that demonstrate that financial development is more likely to benefit those who are already well off because they have easier access, of course, and privileged access often to finance. Similarly for financial globalization, um, this can also affect income inequality because the movement um, of capital across borders, such as through FDI, generally tends to go from advanced economies to relatively high skilled sectors in emerging and developing economies, again, exacerbating the inequalities. Not enough attention has been paid also to um, high levels of unemployment or precarious employment in many cases, even in Europe, uh, this is a problem. And we know this again contributes to inequalities because it reduces the bargaining power of workers. Um, and last but not least, another issue I put on the table is, is we need to question also how we're going to handle technological advancement. Of course, this is not a problem per se, but um, it is also uh, an important factor to consider because it favors those, of course, who have higher skills. It may increase the skills gap and it reduces potentially the demand for lower skill activities. So definitely we need evidence. But we also need to look at ways in which we can strengthen our commitment uh, towards redistribution. As Marine said, we need more investments. We know from our European experience, for example, that investments in health and education are among the strongest means of redistribution, the most effective means of redistribution. This will then in turn raise the issue of how you mobilize domestic resources, because these require considerable investment and sustainable investment over a prolonged period of time to yield results. And increasing domestic resources on, on its own is not sufficient because this will not be politically supported by the population if there isn't a clear demonstration of efficiency and fairness. So results have to be also very visible and it also means we need to um, provide countries around the world with a greater capacity to tackle things like illicit financial flows, fight tax evasion, etc. So um, one challenge we have and which we need to work on is that in many countries around the world, there is a high proportion of informal economy. Uh, and this obviously makes it very difficult to, to actually raise tax revenue. 
um, and uh, this has been exposed very brutally, I would say, by the COVID by the COVID crisis. Um, and a, a work is needed there to also uh, increase the productivity of the informal sector, but also facilitate the transition to the formal um, economy. The final point I would emphasize, but really, really important for us, uh, certainly in the European Commission, is the multidimensional nature of inequalities. And we need to mainstream. You know, inequalities is not a standalone topic. It needs to be mainstreamed in everything we do. Um, and it, a lot of causes of inequalities are sometimes unintended effects of policies in other areas that are you know, well-meaning, but where the inequalities have not been assessed sufficiently robustly and, and in depth. Uh, and we have countless examples. Uh, I won't go into those, but I think we are all aware of those. Um, but this is indeed an opportunity to change that. Uh, so basically to analyze in anything we do in this recovery phase, the impact uh, and the potential effect, positive or negative, on inequalities. Mr. Seychelles, it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic answer as you raise um, a number of the issues, of course, that also help us to circle back uh, to some of the conversations in the opening plenary. Uh, what comes to mind right now is the reality that we've been speaking about uh, Latin America and Africa and very frankly about, to some extent, the inability to endogenously uh, recover uh, without, the, uh, without the support and the assistance of development cooperation partners um, especially in the context of inequality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have less than 10 minutes. So I'm going to try something really special. I want to try a final round of questions uh, with absolute discipline to really quick fire responses uh, from all of you. And I want to start where I ended. Mr. Sheshal, I want to start with you because I want to close the loop on this question of political commitment. We've heard uh, Mr. Melonio speaking about it. And the question to you is where there, there, where there has been demonstrated political commitment, what is the most effective way of supporting that political um, commitment so that we can really see the impact uh, that allows us to move just beyond commitment to actual action on the ground. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull some of the questions uh, from our audience as I go through this final round as well. But Mr. Seychelles, to you first, how do we go beyond com political commitment to political action? Well, commitment needs to be supported. It needs to be sustained. And the best way to support that, of course, first of all, is through the mobilization of necessary resources, transferring also of best practices. There is no need certainly to reinvent the wheel every time, but also through evidence. Um, simply put, uh, no government can afford to make mistakes in this area. So the evidence has to be as clear as possible and has to facilitate decision making as much as possible. And here I'd like to pay tribute to the work of the research facility, because this is the kind of this is the moment where we actually need the best possible evidence base. And indeed, if anything, the complex decision of these multidimensional problems will require more and more uh, and better evidence. So I, I would really say to support policymakers in this in this endeavor is first and foremost. Support policymakers with better evidence and of course better data. Luca, I'm coming to you next. And there's a question from our global audience that I'd like to bring to you. You suggested, Luca, in your opening uh, response that we need to almost reimagine a uh, policy. We need to be open to alternative policies. So I think you might like this question. And the question is, do we not think that it is about time that we started to think about degrowth rather than always seeking economic growth. Today's economic growth seems to benefit the richest population and therefore seems to increase inequality. Is it time we look at degrowth? What is your response to that, Luca? Well, my simple answer would be that we need some degrowth in certain sectors of the economy for sure. For instance, the oil industry, for instance, a lot of pollution-based uh, industries. And at the same time, we need growth in other sectors. We've talked about education, we've talked about health, uh, and we need to talk about green sectors of the economy which need to grow. And then whatever uh, is the impact of that on the overall rate of growth as we measure it today should be a second order question, provided that our social systems, our pension systems, are decorrelated from the rate of growth of the economy. And the issue is that in the Western world, we've constructed our social protection systems in a way that they are actually following that they need a certain amount of growth. So we need to do this decorrelation in order 
order to, to be able to engage in the energy transition, in order to, to engage into more education and health funding in a way that can be decorrelated from this notion of growth. But the good point here is that our basic indicators of progress, for instance, GDP is not really well suited to monitor uh, real progress, to matter, it's not suited at all to monitor the evolution of inequality, the evolution of well-being, the evolution of prosperity. So I would say that we definitely need societies that are post-growth, but whether this means overall degrowth or overall growth, this should be a secondary issue. What we really need to focus is on these concrete objectives, environment, health, education, for instance. I love that. So let's not all think in big picture and broad brush talk. Let's get into the detail. Let's look at individual sectors and let's have detailed data driven conversations around what we need to do there. Minister Guterres, I want to come back to you on the question of labor. In your earlier response, you gave us one of the examples around the phenomenon of outsourcing labor. So there's a question here that's coming from our audience. And it links to uh, the digital economy, which you already spoke about in the first panel. But it says, um, uh, of course, the digital economy appears to be difficult to tax. But what about regulating it? Is Mexico also looking at how to regulate labor standards in digital jobs? Are you looking at regulating labor standards in digital jobs? Uh, your thoughts on that, Minister? Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it presents a new challenge, a, a new sector, but, but, but it's part of a, of a broader problem. Uh, Me Mexico is a, a relatively well-off uh, country. Uh, it's a, a, a high medium income country, but that, that label uh, hides many of the, of the, of the, um, uh, of the inconsistencies be behind it. And uh, let me give you one of the, of the, of the most obvious. Um, Fifty percent of all the people in the in the labor market work in the informal market. So when we talk about the pension system, when we talk about improving minimum wage, when we talk about those issues, that only apply to the forty-three percent that work on the on the on the on the formal uh, labor. The the, the 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 digital economy is more likely than not gonna fail under certain circumstances in the informal labor. So, so what I think that we need to do now is, is to go slightly broader, try, try to see how could we improve either the, 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 the work conditions on the informal labor or how to start moving people, moving in a meaningful way from the informal jobs to, to, to the formal jobs, and then probably put some specific effort in the, in the, in, uh, to, the, to the digital economy. But that, that is just a part, which is a, it's, it's a problem, but it's, it is part of a much larger problem. Mm. Thank you very much, Minister. Of course, raising there the importance of that process of formalization uh, as we look at the opportunities uh, of job creation, but also decent and qualitative jobs uh, within, uh, within the context uh, of, of uh, the digital economy. Emilia, one of the conversations that I'm sure you were listening into uh, in the first panel discussion raised by uh, Professor Thomas uh, Piketty was, of course, uh, the phenomenon of um, not having as much women representation in economic uh, activity, not only uh, something that is uh, true in Mexico, certainly in my country in South Africa, it is um, something that we're looking to improve, as I'm sure is the rest of the world. What are your thoughts in terms of how do we uh, how do we galvanize a larger portion of uh, the women population to become active participants in the economy as one of the ways of reducing the barriers uh, of inequality in in the political economy? Good question, Nosy. I I think women have been particularly active in the political movements lately, and one of their demands is for us to have that flexibility actually the minister referred to it a couple of times but i think what we what we need to do is to actually open up the spaces for leadership for women and uh, the spaces will be taken care of because what we see in communities and grassroots levels it is women that are leading their communities which have that collective kind of kind of way and what we need to do is to take into consideration that we're we're looking for structural changes. So that means a change in incentives in short and medium and long-term, but we do have to have a very clear way in which women in the short-term 
will have that benefit uh, so that the change can be easier. But I think leadership is out there and we've seen it in, in, in many countries is the, the most important political uh, movement that is taking that balance in, in, in every country to make the better decisions. Fantastic, Emilia. Tom, I'm going to end off with you um, uh, on this panel discussion. I mean, one of the things you mentioned right up front in your first response was, you know, the, the fact that the AFD works with demand uh, driven, uh, with works on a, 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 a demand um, uh, uh, approach and is demand driven in terms of how you engage. The question that I, I'd like to bring to you is that what, what would you like to see more of in terms of localized um, development banks and the extent to which they could partner with organizations like the AFD so that your partnerships really help us move beyond, as you described, the theory of trickle-down e uh, economics to the real people on the ground. What could those partnerships look like? Well, thank you, Nozi. Um, ju just a few comments. So one thing I, I said earlier is that uh, uh, certainly, we need governments that are interested in inequality and measuring how spendings are, are targeted. Uh, and probably what I'd like to see is more governments interesting in doing so. Uh, li like I said, um, we're happy to do more with more governments. Uh, secondly, uh, development banks, it's true, we currently, uh, AFD chairs a coalition of development banks. So we're trying to, to, to discuss with other development banks so that they also measure the impact of, of their investments. So they are not only uh, public spendings by governments, but also investments uh, led by uh, public development banks, such as uh, Caisse des Depots in France, but we could name uh, NAFIN, or we could name uh, uh, many banks, uh, the DBSA in South Africa. Uh, so we're very interested in having a conversation with also such important financiers of, of public policies, uh, because public policies are not only government policy, they can also be led or financed by, by uh, development banks. So we're happy actually in having this conversation with a, a more than 453 development banks within a, a coalition that we, 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 we named the finance in common so that all these banks are mobilized against inequality. And, and to be honest, also we, we work on the climate change and, and we hope uh, to work on biodiversity with them. Because again, we, we've discussed governments quite a lot, but let's not forget that uh, many public policies are also financed by other actors. N not, not to mention the fact that we'd like also more private uh, financial institutions to join the coalition uh, so that together we fight against inequality and climate change. So our door is open and I'd be happy to have uh, uh, more contacts after, after this conference. I think it's a fantastic way of closing off this invitation. It's a call to action uh, to all other development banks, it's a call to action to private sector players, because indeed, tomorrow you're right that the financing uh, of those policies that we believe are going to be the key drivers of reducing inequality are not only going to be uh, financed through government spending, it has to be a shared and collective responsibility for all organizations, all sectors of our society. And so with that, I'd like to give uh, to say a massive, massive uh, thank you to my panelists for leaning into the conversation, for sharing their thoughts and their insights, and really giving us the best, um, the best uh, co conversation that could have flown from what started off as a fantastic debate between the minister and Thomas Piketty. Now, as we prepare to close, what I am going to do is I am going to give Toma uh, one last opportunity just to give us some closing thoughts um, as we close off this conversation uh, and then I'll see you straight after this. So Toma, as a closing thought, what are the few words that you might have for our audience? Well, actually, it's it's, you know, it's not a thought, it's just a thank you for our panelists and to you, Nozipo, for uh, chairing this conversation over the last four days. So it was a huge work and we are very thankful that you, you managed to do that perfectly. Uh, I'd like to, to thank also the real organizers, not myself, but my AFD team, Enda, Felipe, and Delphine, also colleagues at the European Commission, Martin, that we saw today, but also Henriette Geiger, Gabriela, Alessandro, and Francoise, and also our colleagues at IC, the Spanish Cooperation Agency, in particular, its chairman, Magdi Martinez Soliman, and Javier Jimenez. Uh, so maybe a particular thank for Minister Arturo Herrera Gutierrez, it's always the most difficult job to be the representative of government. People are always looking at you with this particular <laughs> expectation. So you took, you took the risks. Thank you for taking it. Uh, on a more sad note, unfortunately, we, we, as I said, there were many research teams involved in the conference, uh, 23 of them. Uh, over the last, the, the, the last year, we, we had three researchers and friends who passed away. So I'd like to have uh, some thought for them, Francois Cabedia in Côte d'Ivoire. 
Samuel Fambon in Cameroon and Crispin Mouka in, in, uh, in Zambia. So it's, it's unfortunate I'd like to, to acknowledge their, their memory and, uh, and, and share some thoughts uh, with them. Again, we are quite enthusiastic about the next steps. So it, it's been presented in the video. And again, I'd like to thank the European Commission for funding and supporting and, and sharing this effort. So uh, Martin and, and all your team, I'd like to acknowledge your support. And, uh, and again, I hope to, to, to hear from you very soon. We'll have additional webinars to discuss the ongoing studies, uh, not only in Mexico, but also in Colombia, Morocco, South Africa, and many others. And, and we'll be happy that to, to host you again. So without further delaying the conversation, I'd like to greet our panelists again. And thank you, uh, Nozipo, for, for hosting and, and sharing us uh, over this, uh, this journey. Thank you. <laughs> It's a very big thank you uh, to you, Mr. Malano, and your organization for making this conversation possible. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure journeying with you over the last four days. We certainly hope that you will continue to partner with us and to journey with us as we go into the second phase of the research facility. I look forward to seeing you in more conversations, more data-driven conversations as we heard today, um, and of course, more informed conversation as we also look to make sure that there is equality of voice in everything that we do from here on. From myself, Nozipo Shavalala, in the tip of the African continent, in Johannesburg, South Africa, it's goodbye for now.